Now's when you honk your horn. Welcome! I'm Pastor Mark Winkler from Emmaus Lutheran Church in Orange City, Florida. It doesn't feel like Florida. It, um, it's um, it's kind of cool and windy. Uh, yeah, it feels like Florida because it's, it's cold other places. So, welcome! And if you want to listen on your car stereo, turn on 90.5 on your FM dial, 90.5. Um, it's not a real radio station. It's just coming through this little FM transmitter. And we've had a little bit of difficulty. Yeah, if you're having trouble seeing, drive up where. Don't You don't have to stay in a parking space either. Park where you can see. A little further. There you are, Leah. Good to see you. Welcome, everybody. And um, so we are, we had a, a church service here in the parking lot on Thursday evening. And we, we tried a few things. We... Um, we tried communion uh, with, with communion wine or grape juice. Let the server know if you want grape juice. Um, it's, uh, it's white, white juice. And um, the wine is purple. So here's the way we're going to do communion tonight. You all have a communion wafer in a baggie. And that's not going to change right now. It will probably change later. And when it's time for communion... I'm going to say the words of institution that bless the, the, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. If you want to have the wine or the grape juice, the blood of Christ, come forward and receive that from Pastor Kent Klopphouse. And, um, and if you don't, you're just fine. We believe that, it, that communion with just the, the communion wafer, the body of Christ, we believe that that is enough for communion because when Jesus served his disciples, he said, uh, he blessed the, the bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. So when we take the body of Christ, we have received Jesus and that's enough. It's called communion in one kind. But if you want to have communion, a full communion tonight with the communion wine or grape juice, the blood of Christ, come over to this table and Pastor Kent will take a cup out of the, of the communion tray and he'll have a glove on. He'll put it on that silver tray and you pick it up yourself. You'll drink the, the blood of Christ and then just toss the cup into the receptacle right there. That's how that works. Um, Tomorrow morning, 7 a.m., we're going to be at the far end of the parking lot by our memorial garden, and we're going to have a sunrise service starting at 7 a.m. Uh, sunrise tomorrow is 7:11, and pray for good weather. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a fire pit out there, and uh, we're going to be singing a little bit, I mean, as much as we can do on that end of the parking lot. So, And then at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, here in the sanctuary and we'll be having um, um, our Easter celebration service and we have we're set up for overflow seating if we um, if we if we can't get everybody into the sanctuary we've got overflow seating in the narthex and we also have overflow seating in the fellowship hall and you'll be watching the worship service on a large screen TV 
Not quite the same as being there in person, but you know, between me and you, if I had a chance to worship in there and not get caught sleeping or something, I'd want to try that. You know, I just would want to try worshiping in there. I'm not going to get that chance though. Um, Pastor Kent has been a very faithful helper for this whole year and uh, a very faithful server whenever and however I have needed him. He was going to help tomorrow morning in the fellowship hall and he can't be here because, because um, Pastor Bill Yesi, who is a former pastor of our church, fell a, a month or two month or two ago, he fell and broke his leg in a couple of places. I thought he was going to be at church tonight, but that didn't pan out. Anyway, so in his absence from Ebenezer Lutheran Church in Pearson, uh, Pastor Stan Wickett, also a member of our congregation, has been servicing that congregation. And his wife, Laura, they're members of our church also. Laura, um, is in the hospital right now with uh, heart irregularity and um, she's going to I mean with the good care that she's getting it looks like she's going to be fine but Pastor Stan is not going to cover for Pastor Bill tomorrow so Pastor Kent is is supplying for Pastor Kent or Pastor Stan who's subbing for Pastor Bill there you go <laughs> And that's how you say Happy Easter in Greek, I think. There you go. Um, tonight is a modified Easter vigil. And a full Easter vigil takes hours. We're not doing a whole Easter vigil. You're welcome. We are doing a modified Easter vigil. And the modified Easter vigil calls for four readings. And they're not short. I can read quickly and clearly, but you're gonna to have to listen hard, okay? It's gonna be work for all of us. You'll hear four readings, a reading from Genesis chapter one, you're gonna hear a reading from Exodus chapter 14, from, um, from Daniel chapter, I mean first, from Isaiah 55 and then from Daniel chapter three. And then the service takes a turn and I'm gonna share it with you the Easter gospel and we will hear tonight the good news of Christ's resurrection by the end of the service. So a lot of readings tonight, um, but bear with me. This is, this is as close as we can come under the circumstances to an Easter vigil. I've lit this torch here right now because part of the Easter vigil is to bring the flame which represents the light of Christ among us. And we light this, this candle because um, on Good Friday, just last night, we had candles on the altar, seven of them. And with seven readings, we put out one light with, after each reading. And so the light of Christ, the light that Christ brings into the world was extinguished. And this wind may extinguish this one too. But we light, this, we light a light, a candle or maybe this torch every single worship service until ascension day which is 40 days after easter so we have this here tonight we'll be having the torch out here every saturday worship until we come to that 40 day um, ascension day and then christ rises taking the light of christ with him and we put this torch out um, because he's ascended into heaven and um we still light candles inside for worship, but things change at that point too. Let us begin our service of worship together. A lot of announcements, I know, and I'm sorry. This light is the light of Christ rising in glory to dispel the darkness of our hearts and our minds. Christ yesterday and today, the beginning and the ending. To Christ belongs all time and all ages. To Christ belongs the glory and dominion, now and forevermore. Amen. We do that. All of the congregational responses um, happen with a, a horn honk. 
I'm reading to you um, from the version of the Bible called the Message right now. Later I'll change to the New Revised Standard Version. And I read to you from the book of Genesis chapter 1. First, this. God created the heavens and the earth. All you see, all you don't see. Earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. God spoke, light, and light appeared. God saw that light was good and separated light from dark. God named the light day, and God named the dark night. It was evening, it was morning, day one. God spoke, sky, in the middle of the waters, separate water from water. God made sky. He separated the water under sky from the water above sky, and there it was. He named sky the heavens, and it was evening, and it was morning, day two. God spoke, separate, water beneath heaven, gather into one place, land appear, and there it was. God named the land earth. He named the pooled water ocean, and God saw that it was good. God spoke, earth green up. Grow all varieties of seed-bearing plants, every sort of fruit-bearing tree. And there it was. Earth produced green seed-bearing plants, all varieties, and fruit-bearing trees of all sorts. And God saw that it was good. It was evening. It was morning. Day three. God spoke. Lights, come out. Shine in the heaven's sky. Separate day from night. Mark seasons and days and years, lights in heaven's sky to give light to earth. And there it was. God made two big lights, the larger to take charge of day, the smaller to be in charge of night. And God made the stars. God placed them in the heavenly sky to light up earth and oversee day and night, to separate light and dark. God saw that it was good. It was evening. It was morning. Day four. God spoke, swarm, ocean, with fish and all sea life. Birds fly through the sky over earth. God created the huge whales, all the swarm of life in the waters, and every kind of species of flying birds. God saw that it was good. God blessed them. Prosper, reproduce, fill ocean. Birds reproduce on earth. It was evening. It was morning. Day five. God spoke. Earth, generate life, every sort and kind, cattle and reptiles and wild animals, all kinds. And there it was, wild animals of every kind, cattle of all kinds, every sort of reptile and bug. God saw that it was good. God spoke. Let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature so they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings. He created them in his image, reflecting God's nature. He created them, male and female. God blessed them. Prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge. Be responsible for fish in the sea and birds in the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of earth. Then God said, I've given you every sort of seed-bearing plant on earth and every kind of fruit-bearing tree, given them to you for food, to all animals and all birds, everything that moves and breathes. I give whatever grows out of the ground for food. And there it was. God looked over everything he had made. It was so good, so very good. It was evening, it was morning, day six. Heaven and earth were finished down to the last detail. By the seventh day, God had finished his work. On the seventh day, he rested from all his work. God blessed the seventh day. He made it a holy day because on that day, he rested from his work. All the creating God had done. This is the story of how it all started, of heaven and earth when they were created. A reading from Exodus chapter 14. 
As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and saw the Egyptians coming at them. They were totally afraid. They cried out in terror to God. They told Moses, weren't the cemeteries large enough in Egypt so that you had to take us out here in the wilderness to die? What have you done to us taking us out of Egypt? Back in Egypt, we didn't, we didn't tell, didn't we tell you this would happen? Didn't we tell you? Leave us alone here in Egypt. We're better off as slaves in Egypt than as corpses in the wilderness. Moses spoke to the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm and watch God do his work of salvation for you this very day. Take a good look at the Egyptians today for you're never going to see them again. God will fight the battle for you and you just be quiet. God said to Moses, why cry out to me? Speak to the Israelites, order them to get moving. Hold your staff high and stretch your hand out over the sea, split the sea. The Israelites will walk through the sea on dry ground. Meanwhile, I'll make sure the Egyptians keep up their stubborn chase. I'll use Pharaoh and his entire army, his chariots and horsemen to put my glory on display so that the Egyptians will realize that I am God. The angel of God that had been leading the camp of Israel now shifted and got behind them. And the pillar of cloud that had been in front also shifted to the rear. The cloud was now between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel. The cloud enshrouded one camp in darkness and flooded the other with light. The two camps didn't come near each other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and God, with a terrific east wind all night long, made the sea go back. He made the sea dry ground. The sea waters split. The Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground with the waters, a wall to the right and to the left. The Egyptians came after them in full pursuit, every horse and chariot and driver of Pharaoh racing into the middle of the sea. It was now the morning watch. God looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud on the Egyptian army and threw them into a panic. He clogged the wheels of their chariots. They were stuck in the mud. The Egyptians said, run away from Israel. God is fighting on their side and against Egypt. God said to Moses, now stretch out your hand over the sea and the waters will come, come back over the Egyptians, over their chariots and over their horsemen. Moses stretched his hand out over the sea. As the day broke and the Egyptians were running, the sea returned to its place as before. God dumped the Egyptians in the middle of the sea. The waters returned, drowning the chariots and riders of Pharaoh's army that had chased after Israel into the sea. Not a one of them survived. But the Israelites walked right through the middle of the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall to the right and to the left. God delivered Israel that very day from the oppression of the Egyptians. And Israel looked at the Egyptian dead, washed up on the shore of the sea, and realized the tremendous power that God had brought against the Egyptians. The people were in reverent awe before God and trusted in God and his servant Moses. A reading from Isaiah chapter 55. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come and buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that do not know, that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. 
Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so that my word, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. There's a repeated phrase in this reading from Daniel chapter 3, and I I think it's meant to be humorous because it's ponderous. Um, let's see if you agree. Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits and whose width was 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent for the satraps, the prefects and the governors, the counselors and treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to assemble and come to the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. So the satraps, the prefects and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers and the justices, the magistrates and all the officials of the, of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. When they were standing before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, um, drum, and entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whomever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a fern furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, light, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble shall fall down and worship the golden statue, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. King, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These pay no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then, Nick, then King Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, tr lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble to fall down and worship the statue that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. And, and who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you. In this matter, if our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times more than was customary and ordered some of the strongest guards in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hats, and their garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Now because the king's command was urgent and because the fire was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the furnace of blazing fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, Was it not three men that we threw bound into the fire? They answered the king, True, O king. And he replied, But I see four men unbound walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of the blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their head was not even singed. Their tunics were not harmed and not even the smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted him. They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that utters blasphemy against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Let us pray. Eternal giver of life and light, this holy night shines with the radiance of the risen Christ. Renew your church with the spirit given to us in baptism, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth and may shine as a light in the world through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let the people of God say together, Amen. I want to share with you the Easter Gospel. I started doing this a number of years ago because I had some people come on a Saturday night and it was their only Easter service that they were going to attend. And I stuck close to the theme of the Easter Vigil and I withheld the good news of the coming morning, and they were disappointed, and I, I can't do that. You know, This is not the right way to do an Easter vigil, but I, I cover myself by saying it's a modified Easter vigil, so um, no one, including the bishop, can't, can't say that I'm wrong. It's modified. But I want you to hear the Easter gospel. John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter, the other disciple, and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And she said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. 
The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. Simon saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, the one who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to Jesus in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. It's a lot to think about. It's a lot to take in. Mary Magdalene, a, a woman who knew Jesus well, who wept over his dead body hanging on the cross, who knew that he had been laid in the grave and the stone was rolled in front of it. She goes to the tomb on that first Easter Sunday. She goes to the tomb to, to pray, to weep some more. But when she gets there, what she sees is not what she's expecting. She's expecting a stone in front of a tomb uh, holding the body of Jesus inside when she gets to the tomb while it is still dark, as the Bible tells us. While it is still dark, she looks at the garden tomb and the stone is rolled away. Without looking into the tomb, she runs to tell Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, that they have stolen the body of Jesus. That's her first conclusion, that they have stolen Whoever they are, they have stolen the body of Jesus. Now, grave robbing is illegal today, and it was illegal in Jesus' time also. You leave the dead alone. You leave the dead to rest. But someone has stolen Jesus' body. They have robbed his grave. Now, when Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and we, we commonly think that this is probably John, the gospel writer. He, he has a special place in his heart for himself. And he, he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. And Peter and this disciple have a running race to the tomb. And the disciple whom Jesus loved gets there first and he doesn't go in. And Peter arrives second at the tomb and he goes in and he looks around and then the other disciple, the one who beat him there, he looks around to see the empty tomb but the cloths, the grave cloths of Jesus are, are folded up and laying where that body should be. And we're told that he looked in and he believed. What did he believe? What did he, be did he believe that Jesus had risen from the dead? I don't think so. It's not likely. The very next part of that verse said, for they... For as yet they did not understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. He looked in and he believed, but it wasn't probably that he believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. He believed that Jesus was missing. He believed that the grave had been robbed. 
Then the disciples return to their homes. What a sad ending for them. That first Easter day, they didn't even get the good news that Christ had risen from the dead. They went back to their, to their own homes because they all came to the same conclusion. Mary Magdalene, Simon Peter, the disciple whom Jesus loved, they all came to the same conclusion together that the grave had been robbed. They did not jump to the conclusion that Jesus had risen from the dead. And all of this happened while it was still dark. People, there's still darkness in the world. There's darkness in your life and in my life. And Mary Magdalene is weeping and she's asked two times, she's asked, why are you weeping? Mary Magdalene weeps the tears of humanity. Ever since the first human broken heart, ever since the first sadness that was experienced by a human being, people have been crying. Mary Magdalene's tears represent the tears of all humanity. They represent your tears. They represent my tears. Mary represents each of us individually, and she represents all of us, the whole lot of us, all together. Easter comes. Easter comes while it is still dark. Easter doesn't come on a, uh, on a Easter Sunday in a beautifully decorated sanctuary. Easter doesn't come when we're sitting around a, a banquet table, a feast, an Easter feast with family and with friends. Easter comes in an ER room or in the emergency room. Easter comes in the emergency room when the doctor comes out shaking his head or her head. Easter comes in the funeral home. Easter comes in places where there's sadness, where there is violence, where people suffer, where people are weeping. And, and Easter comes there and then. Why? Because that's where Easter is needed. Jesus comes into the world as the living, risen Savior on Easter to remind us that even while it is still dark in our lives, what is still dark in the world, that Jesus comes bringing life and hope and grace and, and light into the darkness of our lives because we need it. That's why Easter comes, because we need it. And Jesus, he comes to us to fill us with hope where there is no hope. You and I, we know what a dead body looks like. The same as Mary Magdalene, the same as Simon Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. But when they came to the tomb that day, they didn't see a dead body. Why was Mary crying? And when, when she heard her name, Jesus says to her, Mary, and she returns his greeting and she calls him Rabboni, which means rabbi. And then she falls at his feet. That's what I picture anyway. It doesn't, doesn't say that, but she, she must fall on him, grabbing him, maybe around the shoulders, maybe around the knees or the ankles or something. She falls to him and she holds on because she doesn't want to lose him again. And Jesus says to her, don't hold on to me because I have to, I have to ascend to my father. We want that touch. We don't get to see Jesus. We don't get to hold on to Jesus. And yet Jesus comes to us in our times of need. In the pains of our life, Jesus comes to us. In, in the darkness of our life, while it is still dark, Jesus comes because we need him. That's why he comes. And so the good news of Easter is the good news that is ours every day. That wherever there is darkness, Jesus comes to us while it is still dark. Where we need Jesus, where we need comforting, where we need hope, Jesus comes because we need him. This is the risen Savior Jesus Christ and what he offers to us, hope 
beyond hope. Love unconditional, beyond love condition, unconditional. Jesus comes to us while it is still dark to bring light to our lives. Amen. Let us pray together. God of new life, we praise you for your power revealed in the resurrection. Fill your church with the power of your love that is stronger than death. Send us out to tell the good news that gives hope to all. Lord, in your mercy, make us a new creation. God of peace, we praise you for the possibilities of renewal in the resurrection. Fill all the nations with your peace. Draw together people of all nations and languages. Reveal new possibilities and inspire new beginnings. Lord, in your mercy, make us a new creation. God of every blessing, in hope we pray that the risen Christ will bring hope to all who suffer, to those who are afraid or confused, to those who are sick or suffering, to those who are dying, and to those who grieve. Lord, in your mercy, make us a new creation. God of grace, we pray for those joyfully gathered here by your spirit. Give us words to proclaim boldly, Christ crucified and risen. Feed all guests here today with your word and your promise. Lord, in your mercy, make us a new creation. Father God, in thanksgiving, we remember those who saw you in this life and now see you face to face. We thank you for the beautiful spring flowers and for those who are remembered through these living memorials this day. May their faithful witness inspire us to sing our alleluias again and again. Lord, in your mercy, make us a new creation. Passing from darkness into light, from bondage into freedom, from death into life, we commend to you gracious and ever-living God, all for whom we pray through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Amen. I invite you to take out your um, communion wafer, the body of Christ. And if you're coming up for communion wine, um, you probably maybe just sit poised and ready to, um, ready to come out. There's no confession uh, and forgiveness on Easter Sunday. The reason being is because Christ's presence among us communicates that forgiveness is ours through the power and love of his resurrection. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and, and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Take and eat. And again, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my, in my blood that is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Those who want to come forward for communion wine, the blood of Christ, now is when you should come.
receive the benediction. May God who has brought us from death to life fill us with great joy. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia. You are the body of Christ raised up for the world. Now go in peace and share the good news. Thanks be to God.